I'm Max Pollack. I was born in Austria, in Vienna. That's one thing. But then, at this point, I've spent more than half my life in New York City. So I am also a New Yorker. And then at the same time, I also have this part of my soul that, for whatever reason, is anchored in Cuba. And that's kind of the third part of my soul. So it's Austrian, New York, and Cuba. A couple of months ago, I found out that the United States Postal Service has decided to bring out a stamp that honors the art form of tap dance. That's really important because as an art form, tap dance is very vibrant and alive, but it is definitely still very much underrepresented when you compare it to ballet, contemporary dance, and modern styles like hip hop. For us as tap dancers in the tap dance community, it is a very, very big step and a big gesture from the Postal Service and from the government that they recognize the art form as vibrant and important because just like jazz music, tap dancing is one of the most important and oldest parts of American folklore that really talks about what it means to be American because it is a blend of cultures. It is a mix of everything and that's what makes it great. Well, just imagine a uh, big black and white television set in the mid 70s and a five year old hyper active kid who can't sit still and then Fred Astaire comes on and proceeds to jump up and down on the furniture, create unbelievable rhythms with his feet, and look just so elegant and cool. And I said to my parents, I want to do what this guy does. How do I learn that? Mid-70s Vienna was not exactly the place to try to find a tap dance instructor. They couldn't. There was nobody. There was just ballet. But tap dance, no. So what I did was I just went back to the TV. For some reason, OIF had this rotation thing going on where they would play the same old MGM movies every couple of months. They would bring them back. So I got to see, you know, uh, Daddy Long Legs and uh, Flying Down to Rio and, you know, like, uh, and American in Paris with Gene Kelly. I got to see those several times. And every time when they came on, I would be glued to the screen just watching and trying to, trying to understand or learn or remember what they were doing with their bodies, with their feet. Because I didn't have a teacher, so I just went right to the source and I just started imitating. And I just basically started dancing around the living room, hopping up and down the couch and grabbing my dad's hat and my dad's cane and like hitting it on the floor, you know. That was the beginning. And then I did find, or my parents did find some instructors and I took some lessons and they handed me a flyer with a photo of an older gentleman whose name was Carnell Lyons. And Carnell became my first really, really important mentor. I met him when I was 14 years old, and uh, I took a workshop with him. He ended up taking to me rather quickly because, number one, I was the only person in the room who spoke really good English. So I, was, I started translating for him because I also could, I could decipher his very, very American slang. Number two, I could get all the steps faster than anybody else. And he said, Max, my knees hurt. I want you to show the steps slowly while I sit down. I'll show you the steps from the chair. He was already in his 70s, and he had spent you know, 40 years 
dancing and doing acrobatics of the most intense kind. Uh, so, you know, his legs were pretty shot, I would say. But you couldn't tell when he was standing up and tap dancing. He would just like, you know. So for me, it was a very important moment to meet this amazing master. And just to give you a little background, Carnell Lyons is from Kansas City. Uh, he was born in, uh, in 1917. And he grew up in the same neighborhood on the same street as Charlie Parker. They were childhood buddies. They went to high school together. They would go downtown Kansas City, you know, back in the 30s. And Charlie Parker would be playing his clarinet, and Carnell would be tap dancing. So in meeting Carnell Lyons, I, I met a piece of jazz history. I met a piece of American popular music history. It changed my life, big time, big time. And then performing with him and teaching with him, I met some other tap dancers, of course. And he just made me aware of all these fantastic American uh, black tap dancers like Buster Brown, Jimmy Slide, Gregory Hines, Ralph Brown, Cookie Cook, and you know, the list goes on and on. So then I realized, okay, this is really what I want to do with my life. This style of tap dancing is so expressive, has so much natural rhythm and natural energy. This is what I feel like doing, you know, and I feel like I can do it well. So that's how all that started. The reason I came here was because I happened upon an audition for a tap company. And uh, I was just on a vacation, really. And uh, I read the magazine Backstage, which lists all the auditions for people who are interested in theater. And it just so happened that at that particular audition, they were looking for people who could tap dance uh, and could improvise. And the lady who held the audition was Heather Cornell of the tap company Manhattan Tap. Heather and I are close friends. She's my mentor. Uh, she introduced me into the tap scene in New York City when I arrived, which was wonderful because I didn't have to start from zero. It was a really interesting audition. There were many people there, but there weren't many people who had a really high technical level and certainly not many people who could really improvise. And for me, that was an advantage because I had already uh, played drum set professionally, basically, in Austria before I came to New York. And I had also tap danced, first of all, in musical theater. I trained in musical theater at the Theater an der Wien, so I have a degree in musical theater from Austria. I performed as a musical theater actor and singer-dancer on several international stages in Europe already. Plus, I had jazz experience playing drum set and tap dancing in a jazz context. So I knew how jazz music basically worked. And I had improvised in that context on the drums and tap dance wise. And also vocally scatting and stuff like that. Heather was impressed by my abilities. And she said, would you be willing to start working with us? And I said, well, I would love to, but I am only visiting. At that point, I was literally a tourist, so there was no way I could stay, you know. I, uh, uh, I had to leave in two weeks to get back to a contract I was doing in Theater an der Wien, basically. So she said, oh, that's too bad, because in the winter, we're going to do a project with Ray Brown. He's writing music for us, for Manhattan Tap, and uh, we're going to choreograph it. 
and then eventually perform it with Ray Brown and his band. And that's all she needed to say. I, at first I checked, you, Ray Brown, you mean the Ray Brown, the bassist? And she says, yes, the Ray Brown. He's writing music for us. And that was, again, the decisive moment where I knew, okay, well, I will never get a chance like this again. If I don't jump on this, I will regret it for the rest of my life. And I said, okay, I'm coming to New York. And uh, in October, November 1991, I moved here and started working. And lo and behold, you know, we're in rehearsal with Manhattan Tap and in walks Ray Brown in the flesh, shows us this piece of music that he wanted us to do. And he said, what you guys do is amazing because you have to not only work out your steps, you have to memorize everything you do. You can't just read it off the paper. We back here, we have a music stand. We can read the music off the paper, but you have to know everything you do. Plus you have to watch out not to bump into each other and all that. That's amazing. You know? So he was really, really appreciating what we were doing on a very deep level. You know, I was in seventh heaven. I thought I was looking at God, you know, Ray Brown to me was like, you know, it was like jazz royalty. And just like with Carnell Lyons before, it was such a profound connection because both these gentlemen were obviously, they were literally jazz history. Why Cuba? What did I bring to Cuba? What did Cuba bring to me, really? In the beginning, it was a bunch of fantastic Cuban artists that came to the US, that came to New York to perform, um, folkloric artists of um, Afro-Cuba de Matanzas and specifically Los Muñequitos de Matanzas also. And uh, it pretty much started with a tour of Los Muñequitos de Matanzas. And uh, they performed at Symphony Space through the World Music Institute and then did an American tour and it was a huge success. That's a, it's a force of nature. When you see that happening, you can't believe what's going on. Like, they levitate. When I perform with them, I feel like my feet leave the ground. You know, when they start playing, the groove is so deep, the whole thing just starts It's intense. The interesting thing was, timing-wise, I had just started working on incorporating Afro-Cuban rhythms into my tap dancing. I've, at first, I had learned how to play the stuff on the drums uh, and on percussion, on the conga drums, on the timbales a little bit of the bata drums, the, the, the ritual drums. And then I ended up also incorporating body percussion to make the sounds more uh, differentiated. So you could create more melody by using the feet and the hands on the body and then sing. So, you know, that's kind of what I ended up focusing on and developing. Because Cuban music depends so much on coordination. There are so many things happening at the same time in so many levels but it's all held together by this rhythmic key, the clave, the simple rhythm that's an organizational principle. That's like a question and answer formula. Uh, and that holds everything together. And once you understand that and you start working with it, you can work on your independence and you can get to a place where your feet can do one thing, your hands can be doing a second thing, and your voice can be singing or improvising a, a third thing all at the same time. At one point I was performing with some members of the Tito Puente Orchestra and some members of the Eddie Palmieri Orchestra uh, at a club called the New Yorican Poets Cafe on the Lower East Side. And it just so happened that a few members of Los Muñequitos de Matanzas from Cuba were in town and they 
came into the club and saw me dance. So after I had finished performing, they came up to me and asked me who my teacher was. They said, we loved what you were doing. Where, where did you learn this? And I said, well, I don't really have a teacher. I taught myself how to apply this material into tap dancing and body percussion. And they said, oh, really? Can you teach us, please? So that was the beginning of my relationship with Los Muñequitos de Matanzas. And uh, I ended up meeting up with them, uh, giving them a few pairs of my old tap shoes that were still good, but I wasn't using so much. And then I said, and this is how I do the cascara with my feet. And I showed them a rhythm that they play every day. That's part of their, uh, their vocabulary and their tradition. And they looked at it, they watched it like three, four times, and then they did it, and they did it exactly the way I did it, exactly right, you know? And that was the moment for me where I said, wow. And then they invited me to come to Cuba, and I performed with them, and I started choreographing material for them. And they took the choreographed material and integrated it into their hardcore Afro-Cuban folklore performances, making them the very first Afro-Cuban folkloric group that used tap dancing in rumba, hence rumba tap. That's the style that I created. They really embraced it. They were not timid, they just went for it. Just a couple of months after our first meeting and me giving them the shoes, they came back to New York and they did a performance at Symphony Space and they came out in my tap shoes and already did some tap dance rumba thing, just improvised. And everybody went crazy, it was like, what is this? What are they doing? This is cool because the rhythms were there they were already doing so much cool stuff with their feet. I had seen that and I just thought, all they really need to do is put tap shoes on and you already have rumba tap, you know, because they know what they're doing. You just need to ampl amplify it. Yeah, so that was the beginning of this journey. And then as often as I went to Cuba, I would always work with them, teach them, study with them, perform with them. And when they come to the US, we do the same thing. So they're like my Cuban family. And it's, it's hard not to be able to go there more often, but I have a very strong connection to them. It's very, very deep. Bye-bye.